Hello everyone, welcome to our Enology webinar series. I'm um, Andrea Botezatu, Assistant Professor and Enology Extension Specialist with Texas A&M, Texas AgriLife Extension Services. Um, today's webinar will be um, about volatile acidity. Before we begin, um, just a few words about housekeeping, please um, hold your questions for the um, later part of the webinar. So we will have 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Um, and if you have a question, type it in the Q&A um, box or the chat box. Either of those would work for us. Also, once the webinar is completed, please take one minute to fill out the survey that will pop out. And also, um, if you have any suggestion for future themes, I will be happy to hear those. So if you fill out that survey, there is a, a spot there for you to write out what you'd be interested in learning uh, more about. Uh, so um, our presenter today is um, Denise Gardner. Denise graduated from Penn State's food science program with a minor in horticulture in 2007 and earned her master's degree in food science and technology with an emphasis in enology from Virginia Tech in 2009. Her graduate research focused on the use of an electronic nose technology for volatile analysis in grapes, juice, and wine. Following graduate school, she worked in Napa as an artist of inquiries sensory scientist, assisting wineries with specific wine sensory studies and conducting in-house evaluations on enological products. After returning to the eastern U.S., Denise was employed by Penn State Extension and focused on wine quality education, covering topics such as sensory evaluation, fermentation nutrition, good sanitation practices, and wine chemistry concepts. In 2013, Denise obtained the Certificate Specialist of Wine accredi accreditation from the Society of Wine Educators and earned her Level 3 certification from the Wine and Spirit Education Trust in 2015. In 2017, she became the chair for the American Society of Enology and Viticulture Eastern Section Organization. Also in 2017, Denise Gardner launched a proactive wine consulting service, Denise Gardner Winemaking. Thank you, Denise, for being um, today uh, here with us and for this presentation. So please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, sure. Today we're going to talk a little bit about volatile acidity, or VA. And I guess before we get started, if um, anyone has any trouble hearing me, please go ahead and and send a chat uh, over to let us know if there's there's any problems. Um, I call this the silent wine spoiler because it's one of those flaws that can creep up on you at any time. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit today about uh, what it is, what makes a wine more at risk for having high volatile acidity and different preventative and remedi remediation controls in terms of uh, fixing a high VA wine. <clears throat> I always forget, I have to hit this button. Okay. So what, let's start by just uh, giving a wine flaw a definition. What is a wine flaw or a wine fault? You'll hear those terms used interchangeably. A wine flaw is typically something that's an undesirable characteristic or an unpleasant characteristic um, that's found in the wine, but it can result from anything um, in the vineyard to different winemaking practices, um, and even sometimes storage techniques used uh, both before and after the wine is packaged. And the reason why I give you this um, definition is because there's a lot of different things that can contribute to the wine being somewhat unpleasant or undesirable. And of course, there's a subjective uh, point of view from this. But in our case, when we talk about wine flaws, especially the ones I'm going to cover today, a lot of them are caused by what I heard UC Davis use as key impact compounds. And these are typically an odor um, that's associated within the wine or an aroma that's associated within the wine that can be related back to a specific chemical or a group of chemicals that has a consistently identifiable smell or flavor. Um, so there's a bunch of different examples of this, and I'm, I'm going to give you those examples. But the reason why this is so important is because these technical flaws 
are consistent across the board, across wine regions, across wine varieties. Um, it doesn't matter which wine could have them. It's, it's consistently that same compound and pretty much that same um, odor that's related to that compound. With that being said though, as individuals, we have varying sensory um, abilities. And so there is still this element of uh, the perception of these flaws varying from person to person. But in general, um, we know we can consistently find these um, compounds when we have some of these flaws uh, in a wine. So I can give you an example of sensory perception varying. When I took uh, the wine flavor course at UC Davis, uh, we were we did a day or two days of uh, sulfur-related um, uh, wine flaws, I guess you could call them. And the only thing these compounds have in common is that there is the element sulfur in the chemical makeup of those flaws, but the compounds themselves vary and then their associated aromas vary. And at the table I was sitting at, we were smelling um, a whole series of different uh, um, sulfur containing uh, compounds associated with flaws. And there was one wine glass that I thought smelled beautiful. It was very raspberry. It was very bright, vibrant, fruity. Um, and everyone else at the table was turning their nose at this wine because they all smelled really intense canned corn, whereas I was smelling this really strong element of fruit. And so it became very apparent to me that I was pretty much blind to that um, compounds at the concentration that is pretty much considered a flaw in wine. And it just gave me some background as it should give you background that when we talk about these different compounds and being able to sense them, um, to understand not only what your strengths are and what you can routinely and consistently smell, but also what your weaknesses are. Um, and it encourage you to really have multiple people smell the wine in that case, especially if you think there could be something there that you can't smell at all. So these are typically the, the elements or the flaws that I consider to be pretty technical in nature. Um, and I mean that saying that again, that these can reach across the board into multiple winemaking regions, into multiple varieties of wine. There are a few others that we could add here, things like smoke taint or geranium. Um, off flavors, but these are really the ones that I see the highest um, uh, rate of incidence across the board, regardless of where I'm tasting wine. And so these are really the ones that I focus on the most. And again, each one of them has an associated impact compound. So for oxidation, the impact compound is acid aldehyde. This tends to smell like sherry in really high concentrations. In really low concentrations, it can smell like plastic or simply just mute the fruit of the wine. Reduction um, is not my favorite term to use, but when you hear people say this wine is reduced, typically this goes back to the sulfur containing off odors. This can include hydrogen sulfide or H2S, the thiols and mercaptans, which are essentially the same same group of compounds, there's just two different words to describe them, and also the disulfides. In comparison, we also have high free sulfur, which really is just the compound sulfur dioxide. So again, all four of those groups of compounds, the only thing they have in common is that sulfur makes up a part of their chemical structure. But I put this up here purposely as two different flaws to really encourage you to never use the term sulfur when you are describing a flaw in the wine because there's four different types of um, sulfur containing compounds that are related to a wine flaw. Cork taint is another one and this is um, caused by most typically the compound 246 trichloroanisole, which we commonly just call TCA. There's a few other compounds that can get um, put into the cork taint group, um, uh, more haloanisoles, but this is primarily the one that we focus on TCA. Of course, volatile acidity. Um, volatile acidity is really relating back to the acetic acid concentration of wine, but we also identify high BA with the second compound, ethyl acetate, which we're going to talk a, a little bit about in a moment. Um, another flaw, the not ripe or greenness. This is usually related to IBMP, isobutyl methoxypyrazine, and that is the compound that gives you the green bell pepper, pepper characteristic. So 
Again, although we find this in higher prevalence rates in some varieties, no one really wants a lot of uh, green bell pepper in their wine. So I put it in here as a um, wine flaw, technical wine flaw um, that can come really in any wine because it can come from green matter um, in it during the stages of uh, wine production. And then finally, Britannomyces. Britannomyces has a ton of different uh, aroma compounds that can be um, a part of a Brett infected wine. But the three that we tend to see in the highest uh, rate associated with Brett are 4-ethylphenol, 4 glycol 4-EP and 4-EG, and then also isovaleric acid. The one thing I do want to note about Brett is even though these are the associated impact compounds, 4-EP and 4-EG can also come from um, things like barrel aging or any sort of integration of oak. It's just typical that you won't see those two compounds in as high of concentrations uh, in wines that have had oak influence and that are not infected with Brett compared to if you do have a Britannomyces infection. And then also you'll see some of those compounds in wines that have been affected by smoked heat as well, but in higher concentrations than we typically see with Britannomyces. So you can have the same impact compounds, um, but sometimes the concentration really makes a difference in terms of whether or not there's a flaw in the wine or not. And we'll see that a little bit with VA today, which is what we're really going to focus on for this presentation. So the definition, the technical definition of volatile acidity is the total concentration of volatile acids or those acids that are separable by distillation. And when we talk about distillation, um, in this case, the image that typically pops up into my head is the cash still, um, because that's usually what we use analytically to separate these volatile acids, these acids that do come out of the wine and can be made into a gas with some, some heat exposure. Um, and in this case of wine, the primary one that we deal with is acetic acid. Now there's other acids in wine that are volatile, but they're pretty negligible in terms of concentration. So when we talk about VA from a wine perspective, we really are just talking about um, or focusing on the acetic acid. Acetic acid should be familiar to you. This is the smell of vinegar, taste of vinegar. It is vinegar. Vinegar is made up of a percentage of acetic acid. And then I put here the threshold, which is where 50% of the population can sense and identify that they're smelling or tasting acetic acid. And that threshold is 1.6 grams per liter. Now that may sound very small to you, but in the world of sensory science, this is actually a fairly high threshold, meaning that it takes a lot of this pure compound before you can actually smell it, especially by nose, um, and identify it as being vinegar. And I make a point of this um, for two reasons. One is because the other compound that we typically associate with volatile acidity is this one, ethyl acetate, um, and its threshold is much, much lower in the milligram per liter range as opposed to the gram per liter range um, associated with, vine with the vinegar aroma or acetic acid concentration. The other point, which I'll show you in a minute, is the difference in threshold versus the legal allowable limits in wine. So ethyl acetate, it does not um, contribute to the volatile acidity in an analytical sense. When we measure um, the VA, ethyl acetate is not actually contributing to that number. But the reason why we typically associate with VA is because it's almost always found when we have high acetic acid concentrations, it's breakdown products of acetic acid. And it gives us this nail polish or nail polish remover um, type of aroma. And again, it's a great indicator because we can smell it in much lower concentrations um, and it's, it's pretty hard to ignore. It's very pungent and solvent-like. So I put this up here to kind of just explore a little bit some assumptions that are typically made about wine. Um, and this quote by Louis Pasteur really emphasizes how things can go wrong in the winemaking process. Uh, there's a fine line between wine and vinegar. During Pasteur's time, uh, most people believed that alcoholic fermentation was a chemical event. So they just thought your grapes 
were thrown into a vat and then they automatically turn into wine through some sort of chemical interaction or um, uh, chem chemical formula. But it was actually Pasteur that discovered that wine was made through some sort of microbiological component. And I think when most of us think about harvesting wine grapes um, that are destined for wine production, we just sort of assume that this is a guaranteed end result, that we'll add yeast and we'll end up with wine in the end of um, that process. But it's not really guaranteed. As winemakers, we typically end up with wine because we are actually manipulating um, not only the production of how that wine is made, but really the microbiological system associated with the wine grapes or the mustard juice and directing it so that the outcome is pretty much in our favor of becoming wine. So in this case, one example could be going ahead and inoculating with a commercial wine yeast, which is supposed to be depicted there in the center of your screen. Um, interestingly enough, it was Pasteur that found these uh, round, plump uh, microorganisms, which we now know are yeast, were associated with wine when it turned out to be wine correctly and how we would identify wine today, but that there was some sort of morphological change in those microorganisms when the wine actually didn't turn into normal tasting wine and instead soured. Um, and it was his belief that he thought those, that morphological change microorganism that soured the wine um, was actually the same organism that made the production of vinegar happen. And eventually he would come and, and get to this, this final thought um, and, and prove that in the scientific community. But from our perspective as winemakers, uh, we can see that yes, you know, we can end up with this wine product, but it's not uncommon for some sort of microorganism to actually progress the wine further, that there is a progression past wine into this um, vinegar-like products. So we can either get this contamination or this process, depending on how you look at it, occurring, uh, you know, during primary fermentation or post-primary fermentation. And those microorganisms, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit about here in a moment, are what really progress that product further into vinegar. So I like this diagram because it really shows that we have wine grapes, and yes, we hope that our winemaking practices turn it into wine, but there is potential for wine to transform further into this vinegar-like product, whether it was desirable or not desirable, depending on our production practices. So wine's a transitional product. It's something that we have to think about in terms of preservation and production of that product. These are the volatile acidity legal limits uh, here in the U.S. for white, red, and dessert wine as outlined by the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations. So for white, it's 1.2 grams per liter, red 1.4, and dessert is 1.2. If you are exporting, the international legal limit tends to be 0.9 grams per liter, so a little bit less than what we allow here in the U.S., um, for the U.S. market. But remember, the threshold in terms of when most of us can smell the acetic acid is 1.6 grams per liter. And I put this here as a reminder because almost every winemaker I talk to, every winemaker, um, knows what vinegar smells like. And so the assumption is that they will know when vinegar becomes a problem because they can identify the smell of vinegar. They know what it smells like and they'll know it's vinegar. But here's the kicker. By the time most of us will be able to smell the vinegar, myself included, it's already too late. You've already gone past the point of which you can really um, do something with that wine that may make economical sense um, for it to continue on uh, through the process. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit further about that, how to deal with that later. But this is really just to reiterate the fact that it, it's very important to monitor VA from probably an analytical perspective. And I'll give you a few time points on when to measure it so that you know a problem is occurring 
as opposed to allowing it to silently sneak up on you and then suddenly become a very big challenge or a very big problem in your facility. So what winemaking processes put a wine at higher risk for a high VA? Again, any wine can end up with a high VA and there's a few that contribute to the VA in general. The first is just primary fermentation. Um, our wine yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae will naturally produce acetic acid during primary fermentation, though they should never create um, enough acetic acid to lead a wine into a high VA state. Most of them are going to end up with acetic acid concentration or a VA of 0.2 to 0.4 grams per liter by the time primary fermentation is done. And in most cases, by the time malolactic fermentation is done as well, it should still be around those points. Fruit flies um, are a problem because they carry acetic acid bacteria um, on their legs and their proboscis and they can move the acetic acid bacteria from the place that they pick up that bacteria to a clean surface, whether that's fruit or um, must or juice sitting in a tank, whatever it may be. So they're really a contamination source um, and can help spread the bacteria through your winemaking facilities, which is why controlling fruit flies is very important. Wetter vintages tend to cause, on average, increases in VA. This is typically related to the higher incidence of rot, um, but it's just something to consider that if you are going through a rainy season, like many of us are here in the Mid-Atlantic right now, VA becomes an immediate problem. Um, and in those cases, in those years, I would say the best thing winemakers can do, though I know it's a little bit extra work, is to really get a starting VA for their, their juice. Um, and that's also true if they're dealing with um, this, this beast, um, sour rot, because sour rot tends to also uh, increase the volatile acidity limits. So having that, that analytical number in your juice really gives you a starting point of what you're dealing with in terms of a high VA wine. Um, and it's unfortunate, I just took some pictures of sour rotted fruit yesterday, but I didn't get a chance to upload the new picture. Um, but you almost always know sour rot's affiliated with VA because you can actually smell the vinegar as you're walking through the vineyard. It's, it's very disheartening from a growing and winemaking perspective. Some of our processes like, um, you know, storing wine in tanks and not having it all filled all the way to the top or having some eulage or headspace in barrels. They're also going to put wines at a higher risk for VA simply because of the oxygen exposure um, affiliated with that wine. And we'll talk a little bit more about oxygen exposure in just a moment. And then the last um, higher risk component associated with high VA is high pH wines. The reason for this is not necessarily that they can harbor uh, acetic acid bacteria better than other wines, but it's more of a, a point that it's very hard to preserve high pH wines. You know, sulfur dioxide becomes somewhat obsolete in high pH wines because you need to add so much in order for it to have its antimicrobial effects. Um, and in this case, something like potassium sorbate is not going to provide any protection against your acetic acid bacteria um, because potassium sorbate is only effective against yeast and molds and only effective for its um, shelf life in that product, which I believe is about a year. Um, so it really leads, leads winemakers producing high pH wines, um, perhaps in the, the Texas area, uh, with a challenge in terms of preserving their wine, making sure it can go through primary fermentation and malolactic fermentation, and then through its storage processes or aging processes, and still not result in having some sort of acetic acid uh, contamination and then an associated high VA. From a microbiological perspective, the source of VA is typically affiliated with this group of bacteria, the acetic acid bacteria or acetobacter. These are the ones that are going to produce acetic acid at its highest rate. But there are other contributors like some lactic acid bacteria. So if you're doing 
uh, native malolactic fermentations, some of those natural strains can produce more acetic acid than others. Um, and you also have your spoilage yeast like Calecra and Britannomyces, which tend to increase the volatile acidity as well. So if you're thinking about products that are thinking about processes like cold soak and you're in a high pH um, wine making area, then you may run the risk of having some of these spoilage microorganisms really take advantage of that situation and produce more acetic acid at the onset of primary fermentation or before primary fermentation even starts, as opposed to starting fermentation as soon as possible and getting it into a state of control. And then finally, I already mentioned that our basic wine yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, also contribute a little bit to VA, but again, never to a point of spoilage or a high VA situation. So if we look at acetic acid bacteria just a little bit closer, there's a few things I think are important to note about them. The first being that they're pretty much everywhere. They're a ubiquitous group of bacteria um, and they're one of the few that can survive and thrive in low pH and high alcohol environments. So even if you're dealing with a high pH wine uh, at around four, that's still on the scale of pH in a low pH region, um, especially when you look at it from the microorganism perspective. Um, so they really have this uh, great opportunity to, to thrive in, in those environments. The other thing to note about them is that they like to grow very quickly as the wine becomes warmer. So with every five degrees Celsius increase in temperature, they can uh, grow twice as fast. So this is definitely a great place to mention that something like temperature control and keeping the wine cooler um, can help uh, reduce the growth rate of these bacteria. It can act as a preservation technique for your wine. Now, it's not going to make sense for every wine variety, but it is a tool in your winemaker toolbox, essentially in terms of how to control them, because it's assumed they are in your cellar. If you went ahead and swabbed any part of your cellar, whether it be a vent, a wall, a corner, a tank, wherever, you're almost always going to become, uh, you're almost always going to get a positive result affiliated with this bacteria based on how ubiquitous they are. They can also survive high fermentation temperatures. So if you're looking at your juice under the microscope and you see you have acetic acid bacteria in the juice, um, you should know that you'll probably have them in the wine post fermentation because the high temperature doesn't kill them. Now, if you're doing something like a high temperature, short time pasteurization step, pre-fermentation, um, then that will kill them. It's, it's high enough to reduce their uh, microbial population, but our primary fermentation temperatures are not typically getting that high. Um, so it's just something to consider that not only can they survive through that high fermentation, but they can also thrive in an alcohol-based environment. And this is really the, the key to understanding acetic acid bacteria. They absolutely need oxygen to survive and grow, pretty much like us. Um, so if you can reduce oxygen exposure and you can reduce dissolved oxygen in your wine, then you can reduce or control the growth and survival of acetic acid bacteria. So when we talk about preventative control, most of it is going to circulate around managing oxygen, and uh, managing typically something like sulfur dioxide levels. These are the common wine production steps that typically contribute to high VA. When I'm dealing with uh, winemakers that have wines with high VA, we go through the process, we kind of go backwards and figure out what they did with that wine and we can almost always pinpoint exactly where their acetic acid bacteria growth is coming from. So the first one is native fermentations. Again, keeping in mind that some of those native or natural yeast strains and also bacteria can contribute to acetic acid production. The strains that you purchase through a commercial supplier, they've been selected to not give you these high um, acetic acid or other flaws um, rates in, in your wine. Uh, so that is the benefit to using commercial strains. Um, and kind of avoiding, I guess, the, the risk right from the beginning of production uh, of making wine in terms of getting a high VA. Uh, 
Cold soak is another problem, typically be not because of the cold soak process itself, but it's usually because of how the winery is going about doing cold soak. I would say if you are adamant about doing cold soak for your reds or your whites, whatever it may be, I, I would recommend using dry ice and sprinkling dry ice into your, your bins. I'm assuming you're doing them in open top bins. Um, to help get rid of the oxygen because the carbon dioxide will be uh, letting off from the dry ice and also quickly cools your fruit. If you are storing your fruit in an environmental chiller, that center of your macro bin essentially stays warmer than the rest of the surrounding fruit uh, in the bin and that, that warmer center can become a very heavy place for uh, microbiological growth and potentially spoilage growth that you may not want before you even go through primary fermentation. So cold soak um, is definitely a, a risk factor, it's especially a risk factor if you have rot on your fruit. And it's not typically recommended that you go through cold soak if you don't have pristine fruit. The eulage or headspace, this is an obvious one, almost everybody knows about this. Needs the water. Um, if you have headspace in your barrels, which does occur through natural uh, evaporation of water and ethanol over time, um, then you can get higher incidence rates of acetic acid bacteria growth. Um, but something to note about barrel storage, especially, is that you do get a vacuum associated with that evaporation as well. And so you don't want to top up your barrels too often because you'll eliminate the vacuum, which eliminates oxygen from being inside your barrel. Um, so I typically don't recommend winemakers top up more than um, about a month or every other month, uh, again, to allow that vacuum to exist and help keep the acetic acid bacteria levels down. Sluggish fermentations or stuck fermentations are another problem. And this is why if you get them, um, well, first it's important to monitor your primary fermentations every day and, and watch the reduction in sugar and your temperature. Um, and then if you get them, it's important to quickly take care of them. It's not something that you want to sit around for weeks because essentially your wine is, is really left unprotected. There's no sulfur dioxide in the wine. It may be cool, but it may not be cool enough um, to allow you know, fermentation to continue to progress and finish. And so that opens up an opportunity for other microorganisms like acetic acid bacteria to really go to work and do their thing while they have you know, oxygen available to them and are nice warm temperature to thrive in. Um, so if you do end up in that sort of situation, you want to address it as soon as possible and try to get it restarted as quickly as possible. Yeast selection also makes a difference, not so much because yeast will provide you with more or less VA, but it's, it's based on your yeast selection in certain situations. So if you have high rot fruit, high incidence of rot in your fruit, you want to select a yeast strain that's going to get through primary fermentation very quickly um, to help minimize the opportunity time that something like acetic acid bacteria has to grow and, and hence spoil your wine. The other consideration with yeast selection is, again, in a high rot situation, you may want to consider things like co-inoculation, where you're inoculating with both a yeast strain and a malolactic bacteria strain at the same time and allowing them to progress simultaneously in order to avoid that pause in production between primary fermentation and malolactic fermentation, which essentially, again, is an opportuni opportunistic moment for acetic acid bacteria to really grow and create high VA for your wine. And then, of course, poor sanitation. Um, this is especially, I mean, it's, it's just common sense. You need to have good cleaning and sanitation practices in order to minimize the incidence of acetic acid bacteria growth. So in a second, I'm going to talk a little bit about biofilms. Um, if you look at this, this is a neck of a carboy here. You can see kind of that buildup of juice and solids in the neck of that bottle. This essentially becomes a biofilm. It's a buildup of acetic acid bacteria and other microorganisms that can utilize the substrate on, uh, in this case, the carboy and also the oxygen in the surrounding environment. 
Um, and this becomes a, a risk zone for you. So there's other places where this can become an issue. Um, you know, when you have juice dripping on the sides of your tanks, drains can become a huge um, buildup area. And so if you don't have good cleaning and sanitation practices, then you have a higher uh, probability of continuously building up microorganism populations and infecting your wines. Um, something as simple as harvest, I can't stress this enough, but you have to get your solids off of your equipment every day after you're done harvesting and then go through a good sanitation regimen in order to avoid um, microbiological buildup on your equipment because your grapes, your juice, your wine is all going to come in contact with that equipment. I know it's time consuming. I know it doesn't seem worth it because you can't see, physically see the microorganisms, but it makes a difference in terms of your starting populations. So taking a look at prevention techniques for high VA, how to avoid getting a high VA in your wine. The first is looking at your incoming fruit. Um, so one thing I know we deal a lot with, I know other wine regions deal a lot with is sour rot. You wanna try to minimize the amount of sour rot that comes into your cellar because essentially you're just bringing in microorganisms that are gonna to contribute to VA. Um, if you can do some sorting in the vineyard, um, which, you know, that's what I was seeing uh, some wineries doing yesterday, um, or some sorting on a sorting table in the cellar, those are going to be really great practices to help reduce the amount of sour rot that's in your fruit. The other thing to think about is if you're bringing in um, grapes or juice from other states, um, there's possibilities for that fruit or juice to sour while it's in transit. So understanding how the fruit or juice is going to be um, shipped to you and, and what the practices are on the other end of that chain in terms of pre preserving the fruit or the juice is really important because I have seen winemakers have to um, get rid of an entire, you know, truckload of fruit because it, it arrives completely soured um, and it's just not worth them working with in the winery and then also bringing higher populations of bacteria into their winery as well. Second is good winery sanitation, which I just, you know, uh, touched upon. You want to make sure to establish and maintain really good sanitation practices. I try to work with all of my clients in terms of making uh, this a really foundational step in their daily production. Harvest is tiring. I completely understand that. But you can create practices that become habitual and not only increase efficiency on the production floor, but also really minimize things like high volatile acidity because you're maintaining really, really good cleaning and sanitation skills without having to uh, really take, I don't want to say time, but without having to really monitor what's going on. It just becomes a habit to your employees. Uh, so things like making sure you get solids off of your equipment every time you use it. You want to make sure you do that physical cleaning step and then always ending your cleaning steps with a sanitation practice. And then before you start any sort of production run or you move the wine in any way, you always want to do another sanitation step, not necessarily cleaning, but sanitation step, um, again, to help reduce any sort of uh, microbial content that has built up on your equipment before it comes in contact with the fruit, juice, or wine that you're going to be moving. You want to minimize your biofilm formations. So places where bacteria can build up, this could be uh, vents, drains, the sides of your tank. You don't want wine and juice dripping down the sides of your tank. If you're using macro bins, um, one thing that can really help though, I know this sounds pretty neurotic, is spraying down the macro bin, either with an acidulated SO2 sanitizer or um, an ethanol um, blend to, you know, wash down or wipe down those grapes that are and juice that have kind of stuck to the internal part of the macro bins. And that will also help keep your fruit fly population down because again, you don't want fruit flies in your cellar, um, not only because they're a nuisance um, and because they're dirty, but because they're going to potentially transfer bacteria from dirty fruit to clean fruit. So have a plan for treating your juice. This is also important. Um, again, uh, if you have grapes, 
you want to avoid cold soak on poor quality fruit. Um, one thing I have found some wineries really benefit from is monitoring their juice um, by looking at it through a microscope and identifying kind of what the microbial content of the fruit is coming in. It gives them an indication if there's something they have to consider um, through the production of that wine. So if they see they have really high acetic acid populations or what they think is high acetic acid populations, there are steps they can take to help reduce the population size um, and maybe also consider how they're going to treat the juice and the wine through production. So this is probably better illustrated through an example. So if you see something that comes in with a lot of acetic acid and you have a high pH wine, um, there are now products on the market where you can quote unquote find out some of those populations. Um, so that will help reduce your microbial content in the start. And then maybe you wanna do some um, acidification additions to bring down the pH to help you know allow you to get to a point by the end of primary fermentation where you can provide better preservation for that wine, either through uh, temperature control or an SO2 addition where it will be more effective at a lower pH as opposed to the high pH. You also want to try to avoid cross-contamination between rotted or high VA products and clean products. And this goes back to maintaining really good sanitation. Have a good clean cleaning and sanitation protocol will really benefit your, your winery. Um, but also if you're bringing in multiple lots of fruit during the day during harvest, you always want to process the cleanest fruit first and end your day with the most rotted. Um, simply because that way you're not contaminating or you, you're reducing the risk of contaminating that clean fruit um, right from the get-go. Again, you can consider co-inoculation, so using a yeast and malolactic bacteria strain that can work in harmony with each other and go through both primary and malolactic fermentation at the same time to help minimize that opportunity where there's no protection in the wine from a preservative standpoint and um, it allows you to get SO2 and stabilize the wine much quicker, which may be important if you're dealing with something that isn't really of optimal quality. Using aggressive yeast strains. So again, this kind of goes back to the microscope example I gave you, but if you see you have a lot of uh, incoming um, yeast and bacteria on your fruit, then you can change your yeast selection to something that may be a little bit more aggressive that can outcompete those natural uh, microorganisms and hopefully get you through primary fermentation in a much cleaner way. And then you also want to make sure you uh, manage your nutrient uh, strategies when you have a lot of uh, mi microbial populations on your fruit because you don't want to over supplement your, your fruit with nitrogen or your fermentations with nitrogen because that essentially becomes a source of food for everything, for all the microorganisms that are in your wine. And this is really a case for measuring yen and making sure you look at what you're starting with so that you aren't making supplemental um, incremental additions during primary fermentation and perhaps feeding your spoilage microorganisms like acetic acid bacteria. You also want to manage your wine processing strategies. So those things I just told you about were just for juice, just to get you through primary. From the winemaking side, you want to avoid oxygen exposure after primary fermentation. Acetic acid bacteria absolutely need oxygen to grow. So you have to find a way to control the oxygen um, that they get access to. Things like topping up your barrels every one to two months, that helps minimize their growth. You want to make sure that you either fill your barrels or I'm sorry, fill your tanks as much as possible or use some sort of inert gas properly, which is typically much more repeatedly than I hear in the, the winemaking scene. Once a week typically is not enough to manage headspace in a tank, um, but you again need to rely on what kind of gas you're using and what your, your gas supplier may say. And you want to make sure you have really tight seals on your barrels using silicone bones to, to maintain um, a good seal on the barrel and manage that vacuum that's natural through the evaporative loss um, during barrel aging. 
You want to manage your SO2 addition. So it's good to make one large addition at the end of whatever process, whether it's primary or malolactic fermentation. And that should kind of sustain you through most of the wine's life at that point. Um, and it can be more advantageous to do that than making very small increment incremental additions over time, which may get absorbed or are not easily spread out um, um, throughout the wine in order to knock back populations of spoilage bacteria like acetic acid bacteria. Of course, maintaining temperature control and keeping your wines as cool as possible, depending on the style of wine, is, is going to make a difference in terms of uh, the growth of acetic acid bacteria. Sterile filtering wines that do end up having high VA issues or high acetic acid bacteria populations could be advantageous. You may want to sterile filter that wine be before you get to that bottling step, um, like long before you get to the bottling step or right before you get to the bottling step to ensure that you won't have any issues once the wine is bottled. And of course, um, just like with the juice and the fruit, you want to avoid cross-contamination with clean wines and wines with high VA problems and also maintaining good sanitation techniques. The common theme is really maintaining good sanitation techniques. So how do we know if VA becomes a problem? These are a list of uh, analytical ways that we can measure VA um, here on, I think it's the right hand side of your screen. And I would just say that probably the one we use the most in the winery is going to be steam distillation using, uh, let's just say cash still can't believe I didn't catch that. Um, it should be catch, C-A-S-H, still, which I'm going to show you here. So this is a catch still. A lot of people I talk to find this to be a very intimidating piece of equipment. So I'm going to try to break it down a little bit um, to make it a little less intimidating. Essentially, there's a big bulb here at the bottom of this piece of glass. Um, and there's actually two bulbs in there. There's an inner bulb and then this outer bulb. In the outer bulb is just water and that water gets filled up above the coil um, because that coil in there is what's going to heat the water during the distillation process. Um, and as the water heats, then the wine that's in the internal bulb, which I'll show you here, you can see it's kind of a little bit yellow. We are doing a, a white wine that day. Not as great for the photos, but you get the point. Um, as the water around that bulb of wine begins to heat, then it also heats the wine in that inner bulb. And as the wine heats up, it's going to create a gas, which comes up through this inner tube here. You can kind of see it in the middle of that larger bulb. Um, and that gas is going to travel up to the top of that cache still, up to this neck up here. And as it gets up to this neck, it starts to condense into water droplets. And eventually those water droplets will fall down through the condenser, which is here. The condenser has running cold tap water going through it. And then that little coil in the center of the condenser is where the, the gas that has come off of the wine is collecting and it forms into these droplets and travels down that little tubular structure. And eventually it'll reach the bottom here and this outlet port and that outlet port will collect those balls for liquids that have come off of your wine only. Um, and included in that is typically things like some water, maybe a little bit of ethanol, but primarily it's your acetic acid. And that's what we measure for VA. We'll collect that acetic acid sample and we'll do a titration um, based on that titration that gives you the concentration of acetic acid in your wine. So looks scary, but it's not really that scary. It's pretty, pretty easy to use. The hardest part is getting it together. So what happens when you end up with a wine with high VA? So our legal limits are 1.2, 1.4, depending on the wine color or style. Um, but I look at high VA issues around um, the point of 0.7 because that's where some people who are trained can sense it. Um, actually, I have a, a tendency to find wines with quote unquote higher VA at around 0.7 and, and cause concern in wineries. But at that point, seven mark is really a great indicator because you can still do something with the wine to fix it. Volatile acidity continues to be one of those wine flaws where it's probably more cost effective to prevent the problem as opposed to fixing the problem. And the primary reason for this is the cost of reverse osmosis. And most of the wine industries, probably wineries that I'm talking to now, 
don't have easy, affordable access to a reverse osmosis unit. And so your remediation options for volatile acidity are quite limited. Um, I've worked with a number of wineries where they've gotten a quote to use RO, reverse osmosis. And from a business perspective, it just didn't make any sense to put the wine through the RO. And so they had to come up with an alternative solution for that wine, even though they had a problem. So for this reason, I really do put VA problems into two categories. Minor VA issues, which are at about 0.7 grams per liter of acetic acid or less and then major VA issues, which fall over 0.7 grams per liter. Now, this is those numbers are kind of arbitrary. It's really going to depend on what kind of wine you have. But for the most part, 90% of the cases, this is how I would split the wines. So looking at minor VA issues, I would say most wines can tolerate up to about 0.5 grams per liter of acetic acid and be okay. Um, I, I recently tasted... I think it was a Niagara that was at 0.56 and I could taste the acetic acid. I think we all kind of agreed it tasted like acetic acid, but it may not be something that your consumer base may notice, especially as you go through and finish the wine. Um, so those are always important considerations. Um, but as you start to approach that 0.7 mark, it is a little bit more difficult to say your, there won't be customers that um, won't be able to identify it. But in these cases, when you have that 0.7 or below, you can typically filter and blend the wine so that you reduce the perception of acetic acid. In this case, um, you wanna make sure that you always check the VA of the wine that you're going to blend the high VA wine with because you don't want to blend two higher VA wines together. You want to blend that higher VA wine with something that has a low VA and also doesn't have a lot of acetic acid bacteria in it that can continue to to grow. So that's why I encourage you to sterile filter um, the high VA wine first, remove the source of the problem, the acetic acid bacteria, and then blend it. Oops, sorry about that. You can also consider some tannin additions or some things like polysaccharides or gum arabic additions. This may just help reduce the perception of acetic acid. I would say it probably doesn't mask the acetic acid um, to a point where you can't tell it's there, but doing a few bench trials with some recommended products could, could go a long way in, in this case. When you have major VA issues, things that are occurring over 0.7 grams per liter, again, I understand that this is still under legal limits, but it may just not taste very good in your wine. Um, you're really kind of limited in terms of what you can do. And, and this becomes the issue of having to use reverse osmosis to help remove uh, the acetic acid from the wine. It doesn't remove all of it, but it will reduce it and get it to a point that's acceptable. Because remember, there is an acceptable amount in wine that's going to come from primary fermentation. So the primary problem with this is usually the expense and also the availability of getting to a unit that can effectively um, reduce the acetic acid concentration. It does have a tendency, especially if you don't know what you're doing and you have to operate the unit yourself, um, you can rip the wine apart or ruin it completely. Um, so it's really important to use services that may be helpful and that can kind of guide you through the process to ensure that your end result is going to be something that you can work with. And it may be that your end result is something you can work with and then go back to those minor VA issues, looking at things like tannin additions, polysaccharides and gum arabics to help better commercialize your, your wine and get it to a quality that you want it to be at. And then finally, these um, processes, they don't always effectively remove ethyl acetate, which can be argued to be more offensive to some people than the acetic acid concentration. And so it's important when you are looking at your reverse osmosis options to look to see if it can help reduce your ethyl acetate concentration. A little bit of ethyl acetate, again, is not bad in wine, but when you get up to that 150, 200 milligrams per liter concentration, um, it obviously is going to be very pungent and solvent-like in your wine and can, can degrade the, the perceived quality of the wine. Unfortunately, those are the only things you can really do to deal with high VA wines, um, which is why, again, 
I, I took a little bit more time to go through preventative measures because that's really what makes a difference. So in this case, the takeaways are high VA is a common wine flaw. Everybody gets this at some point in their winemaking career. If a winemaker tells you they never got it, just assume they're lying um, because I've seen it uh, a lot. It's a very, very common problem. It's important, I think, as a winemaker to really get comfortable with knowing the aromas and flavors of volatile acidity and also your limitations. It's okay to say you can't smell the vinegar. Um, I, I'm here telling you I can't smell it. Um, typically, I may be able to taste it, but if I just smell the wine, I can't always identify that there is a high VA problem when indeed there is a high VA problem. And this goes back to the high threshold um, naturally that occurs with acetic acid. Remember that individual perceptions of this flaw vary, so it's very possible that someone will tell you that the wine seems to have a high VA. It may not be illegally high, but it may be high. Um, and so it's good to take note of those observations and monitor the wine analytically. Keeping in mind that by the time you can probably recognize that vinegar flavor, it's almost always too late to easily fix it. And that analytical methods can really enhance your ability to find this flaw early. If you don't want it to silently sneak up on you, make sure to take the time to measure it. Measure it in juice if you have rotted fruit or sour rot fruit. If you don't have sour rot or rotted fruit, then you don't really have to worry about the juice, but you should then always measure every wine after primary fermentation, after malolactic fermentation, and let's say every two, maybe three months while it's sitting in storage to monitor its progression because you can catch if it is increasing over time. And then remember prevention is key. There's not a lot of really great remediation techniques for this for this uh, flaw. And so if you want to have an acceptable table wine by the time that you've finished the wine's production, um, preventing this flaw is, is really important. So that's all I have for you guys. This is my information uh, where you can find uh, my website, dgymaking.com. I do a, a couple of um, uh, I do a couple of newsletters that come out. I would say uh, bi-monthly, so it's twice a month unless there's a crisis situation, um, a crisis situation like the one we just had, where we had a ton of rain on the way. So I'll, I'll send out some extra information that may be helpful before. Uh, a winemaker gets to uh, a crisis situation in the cellar. Um, and you can also find me on social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram at DG Winemaking. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Thank you. Denise. Sure. Um, yeah, so we're open for questions now. If you want to type your questions in the chat or Q&A um, box. I see one that says you did not mention re-fermentation as a cure for high VA. It fits you back a year, but you don't have to throw the wine away. Um, re-fermentation could be an option. I would say this is a really desperate option. Um, it doesn't typically work well. And in most cases where I have winemakers that try this, they still have a high VA by the end of their second winemaking process. And in fact, it's just gotten to a point where I just typically don't even recommend it to people because it's, it becomes more problematic than, um, than actually fixing their problem. But I will say if it's working for you and you can analytically show that your VA is getting reduced, then yeah, go ahead and keep using it. It, it isn't, it's a, it's a textbook answer from, you know, from a really long time. It's been suggested before things like reverse osmosis came out. Um, but again, it's just not, something I've had a lot of experience with and, and seeing it work effectively for people. If a VA problem develops in a barrel, are there any barrel care precautions necessary before the barrel is reused? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I have different feelings on this. It, it usually is going to depend on the winemaker I'm working with. The problem with getting high VA in a barrel is that you are likely going to transfer some acetic acid bacteria over to the next lot of wine that goes into it. 
because we, we can't sterilize a barrel. We can sanitize it. Um, and typically today the recommendation is to do some steam sanitation um, as well, or in addition to some um, aqueous ozonation. Um, but there's always going to be things that come out of the crevices of the barrels. It's just a function of, of the wood and, and its natural state. So if you have a wine barrel that has held a wine with a really, really high BA, and, and if you confirm the fact that there's a fairly high concentration of acetic acid bacteria in that barrel, um, I've had winemakers that just get rid of the barrel because it, it, it does become a problem um, or it can become a problem for, for later vintages. If you really can't get rid of the barrel, I would say your cleaning and sanitation make a difference here. You want to go ahead and first do some really good cleaning. You may want to do some soaks with, with water um, to try to get as much out of those crevices as possible. Then go through some sort of steam um, sanitation stuff. I would say I depend on steam. I prefer steam over ozone um, because I've seen a greater uh, consistency with steam currently than the use of ozone. I think ozone makes people feel better, but I don't see it to be as effective as steam. And then um, some winemakers will follow up a steam with then ozonation as well. So Yep, we have another question. Um, do you recommend lab testing for VA of the must and later after primary fermentation is done? Do I recommend, sorry, I missed the first part. So do you recommend lab testing for VA of the must and later after primary fermentation is done? Of the must. Um, I don't recommend doing juice or must volatile acidities unless you have a rot issue and you're worried about it and usually it's more sour rot oriented um unless you have a really really high just you don't know what kind of rot it is on your wine or i'm sorry on your grapes then yeah you can do a, a juice or must va but for the most part that's not common practice i would say common practice is measure it analytically uh, at minimum after primary immediately after primary um so that you know that gives you basically what your starting point of VA is in that wine. And so if you test it again two months later and you see it's increased by 0.2 grams per liter, you now know you have a VA issue on you, your hands. You know that there's something in that wine that's contributing to the rise in VA because that's a fairly steep rise after primary is completed. And so now you can treat that wine accordingly. Does sterile filtration, 0.45 micron, remove VA? It does not remove VA. It removes the acetic acid bacteria, assuming that it's done properly. What positive effect does lysozyme have on spoilage organisms? I am pretty sure lysozyme is only for, I want to say, gram-positive bacteria. I can check. I have a catalog here, but... Lysozyme is not for acetic acid bacteria. It's for um, treating um, um, lactobacillus, or I'm sorry, lactic acid bacteria strains. Mm -hmm. Do you have a catalog? I should just know this off the top of my head, but I don't use lysozyme that often. Um, and I don't, it's not a recommended uh, product for acetic acid bacteria. However, there are some products now um, I believe they're usually made with um, chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N, um, which is that fining agent I was telling you about. And there's a number of different um, uh, suppliers, like fermentation suppliers, like Scott Labs or Nardis or Lafour that carry those products now that may have that alternative for something like acetic acid bacteria. Sometimes they have more than, than one product, so it's important to ask the company um, if it's effective against um, against acetic acid bacteria. So looking at lysozyme, <sighs> let's see. And this says that it's used to control lactic acid bacteria, including enococcus, pedococcus, and lactobacillus. So acetic acid um, bacteria is not included in there. In fact, it says that the enzymatic activity of lysozyme can degrade the cell walls of gram-positive bacteria, including lactic acid bacteria, but not gram-negative bacteria, 
like acetobacter or yeast. So it's not going to be effective against your acetic acid bacteria. Are there any more questions at this point? Will the webinar event be archived anywhere so we can access it again? Yes, um, I record the webinars and post them on uh, our YouTube um, page. Um, and I can send you the link to that page if you want to email me. I can send you the link um, and you can subscribe to that page and you'll be able to see all um, the updates that we post on our YouTube channel every time we post something new. All right. Well, thank you guys. I um, hope everyone uh, has a whole year ahead of no acetic acid bacteria. <laughs> thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Denise, so much for a super informative presentation. Um, if you all can take one minute of your time to fill out the survey at the end of this webinar, I would very much appreciate it. And again, I'm looking for um, suggestions and your interest and in what you would like covered in this webinar series. Again, thank you all and have a good day.